Dear colleagues, thank you for letting me participate in the conference, The Ethics of Sharing Online. I remember how I got intrigued by the topic of the conference when I learned about it before the pandemic started. I namely see the issue of sharing as key to the understanding of several processes that are underway in, in Svalbard. I envy you the coffee breaks and the joy of a physical meeting if in Aarhus, where I've never been. But I hope my contribution can spark some ideas that you will develop further during the coming two days. My name is Denka Sokolichkova and I'm currently affiliated with three institutions. The Czech University of Hradec Králové, the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Oslo and the Arctic Centre in Groningen, the Netherlands. You followed me on my way to this um, somewhat uh, shabby and tiny hut full of wooden clothes for kids, reflectors, thermal cups and waterproof jackets. Welcome to Brüktiken. For over two years now, I am on fieldwork in Longyearbyen, a town of about 2,300 inhabitants from about 50 countries worldwide, the biggest settlement of the archipelago of Svalbard. For those of you who are unsure about the geography, we are very far above the Arctic Circle, about halfway from the north of Norway, which is the country that governs over the territory, to the North Pole. I am inviting you to join me on my way of reflecting over questions that the conference um, promises to explore. And those are, what do we share as human beings? How could sharing be a central ethical concern for all communities? What can we possibly share? What are the limits of sharing? And what are viable forms of sharing for the future? In Longyearbyen, the phenomenon of sharing is of vital importance and the practice of sharing and also not sharing teaches us an interesting lesson. I cannot dwell in detail on the history of the settlement, which has been changing much recently, but some features remain quite stable. The settlement is heavily subsidised by Norway as a geopolitically strategic microcosm located in the high Arctic environment, that is very sensitive to human interventions. I prefer to use here the word sensitivity rather than vulnerability. It used to be a town built around mining coal, uh, but now more people here work in tourism and research, but also in businesses such as satellite technologies or state administration. It is obvious that the Norwegian government will keep investing in supporting Longyearbyen also in the future. Now, I work here as a social anthropologist and I'm interested in the socialities that develop at this unreal place. And I say unreal because according to the official discourse, this town is meant to be a bastion of Norwegian sovereignty. Nobody's home, just a transient, temporary place for fit and resource for people. If you are too old, too sick, too poor, too handicapped, you are expected to take the right decision and leave. The town is internally much more diverse than it might seem from the outside. There are profound differences and inequalities, but the diversity that you encounter in a major European city is not to be found in Longyearbyen. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain the reasons for the artificiality of the town because I think it will be more interesting to show how the profoundly ethical concern of sharing is lived despite the place's boundaries. There is namely a lot that people share here. You can zoom out and look at the phenomenon more broadly. Residents and tourists share space both in the urbanized area and in the vast landscape of the archipelago. Not without conflict, I should add. Or you could zoom out even more to sharing across species. Out there, we are sharing with entities beyond the human society. What is someone's habitat, such as a frozen fjord for a polar bear, is somebody else's free time pleasure. Or sharing across time, there is black coal in the mountains of Svalbard that was formed 60 million years ago and the residents of Longyearbyen are sharing daily the energy that the sun and the plants stored for ages. 
ethical questions and value negotiations that come along these levels and scales are being discussed in town, though perhaps more in private, informal and publicly unheard conversations. Sharing of materials and artefacts is another intriguing facet to encounter. For all sorts of reasons, from natural hazards to geopolitics, houses are being demolished. Yet sometimes whole buildings or materials are being shared and reused to reduce the obnoxious ecological footprint human, human life has on this island. In Brüktiken, a few square meters value laboratory, people donate clothes and household items they no longer need so that other people can take them for free. The local authority wants to invest into an inclusive space where people can be creative, recycle and repair things. An old and fossilized power plant is being re-enchanted as a space for arts and cultural events. There is a bike workshop and a business developing around the ideas of food self-sufficiency and zero waste. On two lively Facebook pages, a parallel local economy is running and members share concerns and emotions. And there is solidarity and care in the town where the shared destiny is encapsulated in a simple fact that Longyearbyen would be uninhabitable without powers and resources that contribute to the overheating of our world, a world that is too full and too uneven, as Thomas Hylon Eriksson puts it. In spite of the legal and political limitations by which the town is constrained, there is a noteworthy potential for resistance towards the idea of economic growth, which we can characterize with the verb to sell, in favor of the idea of sustainability, which can be transformed in the verb to share. Yet this drive, that seems to be an important driver in the life of some people here in town, meets many barriers. The clash of interest scales is quite uh, determining. What is central for my localized life, intertwined with the life of other people that I love or the mountain that I greet every day, is fully irrelevant for a high-ranking politician or bureaucrat. To which extent is the future outlook into which the town is growing based on sharing and fostering the local potential? I'm not sure. Another barrier that we meet on our path towards sharing more instead of selling and buying more is simply our lifestyle. If you want to enjoy uh, everything that life in Svalbard has to offer, and on my paper, which you cannot see, I have the words enjoy and to offer in, in quotation marks because they're not neutral, you need a lot of things. Snowmobile, rifle, cabin, boat, an awful lot of um, outdoor equipment. It is possible to share those, and there are efforts that go in that direction, but the prevalent pattern rather is the one of a demarcation line between those that can and those that cannot afford. We also experience cultural and language barrier in town, which if not worked with, if not actively dismantled, gets cemented and makes sharing again more difficult. And there is more, uh, but I would like to conclude with an attempt to ask the question about viable forms of sharing for the future. The future of Longyearbyen, as it is painted in the strategic governmental uh, documents, is supposed to be techno-optimistically green. Sophisticated solutions to combat climate change, saleable to other Arctic communities, um, are to be developed. The often used metaphor is the showcase, Utstillingsvindu in Norwegian. I'm curious to see whether the quiet, not very fancy, grassroots initiatives fostering sharing, which per se cannot be turned into economic profit, that have been developing in Longyearbyen and that are not essential in Norwegian, but they are essentially local, will play a role. I am curious. I am a bit skeptical, but I'm hopeful. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you.